Hello and welcome to this University of St Andrews, Scotland's Future Series podcast, which is brought to you about the very current um, situation in Ukraine. And today we're talking about reflections on the war of aggression that Russia is waging on Ukraine. And we have a selection of colleagues to bring you their insights um, on the war in Ukraine and in particular about information and what we're hearing about the war just now. I'd like to introduce you to our contributors today. Um, on my left, I've got Taras Vaderko, who is a British Academy Research uh, Fellow focusing on informal political economy of the war, and he's based in the Department of Social Anthropology. So as well as being from Ukraine, um, from the west of Ukraine, you're also somebody who, even before this conflict, has got some very relevant information I think people listening will be interested in today. I've been doing research in Ukraine with ethnographic fieldwork, deep immersive research since 2017. Good. I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit about that today. Immediately to my left, we have our colleague Alice Koenig, who's a senior lecturer in classics, but has also been running the Visualising War project and looking how war stories um, work in a society and what they do. So thanks, Alice, for joining us today. No, it's good to have you here as well. Um, on my right, um, we've got um, Diana Surshik from Kiev originally, but... Um, Diana has been based in Scotland for the past five years, and we're very lucky to have her as a master's student at the School of International Business at the University of St Andrews. Thanks for coming along. And finally, last but not least, um, is our colleague, Professor Phillips O'Brien, who's a professor of strategic studies and the director of the Institute for the Study of War and Strategy. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for coming along today. What I wanted to focus in on, first of all, is that obviously we have four very eminent academics who've got real insight into this conflict that so many of us are following on the television, on radio and on social media, not least Phil's very insightful um, Twitter feed that I'd encourage anybody to, um, to follow. But sometimes in conflicts, we forget the human side of things as as well. Diana, I want to ask you as a student, what, what's it been like following, being here, being based in St Andrews in a safe place, but following this conflict at, at home? I wonder if you can tell us a few of your thoughts and your reflections on what's happening in your country at the moment. Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, being Ukrainian, first of all, I am very heartbroken to hear about it. But being a student, I'm very scared for the future and being a female student, I'm even more terrified for my fellow citizens, for the women who are suffering because of it, for the atrocities that are taking place right now in Ukraine after the full-scale invasion. And even though I am physically here, I am as safe as it gets, my mind hasn't known rest, hasn't known peace since the 62 days ago it started. And to be even more precise, I don't think I've known peace since 2014 when Crimea has been taking over and I've been in my formative years. I haven't even turned 15. Yeah. I was very careless. I was very a happy child who had to learn through the scariest, scariest narrative of war when your friends had to move from Luhansk and one of my closest friends is from there and his family had to move to Kiev and build a life and then two months ago they had to leave again and it's it's impossible to explain that to your children why you have to move why some people myself included I chose to move here I chose to pursue my studies in a different country I chose to speak different language but for somebody who didn't have a choice and who was forced to do that back at home, it's it's impossible, but yet it's happening. And even though it's so hard to imagine, I feel like every single child who will be born and who is born right now in Ukraine, that's the first thing they have to learn is that their safety, their freedom was taken from them. And that's one of the things that scares me the most because 
as a student, I have huge faith in academia. I respect it. It's I'm getting my second degree right now. I enjoy it very much. But at the same time, I start to wonder what went wrong. Like, why did education fail? Why did nobody prevent it? How How is it possible that in the 21st century, when we have access to all the information possible, we live in the digital era? And how is it how is it possible that there are people who are not seeing it through the same lens? And how is it possible that you can misjudge something so much and how much of propaganda and misinformation can be out there for for people's minds to be filled with that? It, it really scares me as somebody who's an aspiring academic and it really makes me question, you know, my entire life I've believed that spending money on military defense was not the smartest yeah. strategy because there is science after all there is art there's so many different areas that offer something great for this world to explore and now all of it just comes down to the basic question of security and what can we do yeah. and what can we study from it that's really powerful and and actually you make a couple a number a lot of good points here one of them is for people who are watching this that this is a conflict that has been going on for eight years, eight long years. I, I traveled to the Donbass and saw that there was a very real war going on when I went there in 2017. Um, but actually your point about living with this conflict since you were 15, although in, in, in fairness it has it, it changed, it stepped up a gear um, on the 24th of February, um, 2022, and we'll explore that. But I think that's a really powerful point and as somebody who's grown up with war, um, in your formative years as, as as well. And the ways in which productive debate and discussion that lie at the heart of academia have failed in this context, and you reflect upon the barbaric acts that are being carried out um, in Europe right now, and some of the appalling um, evidence that we've seen of these, these acts as well. Taras, you've studied this, you're a research fellow, you're a leader academically on, on, on this issue. I'm wondering if you can reflect on some of your feelings as somebody who's, who's, who's from Ukraine, but an expert in this particular field, and talk to us a little bit about you, um, but also talk, talk to us a little bit about the work that you're undertaking and what you're, what you're finding. And also, if I may ask, how easy is it to try and study this particular issue when this is being, what you're studying is applying back home? I mean, that's that's difficult. We, we, we try and look at things dispassionately, but it's not always easy to be dispassionate about things. It's incredibly difficult to, to be dispassionate right now. I mean, it's pretty nigh impossible. And um, for the past four months, with the build up to, to the invasion that I didn't believe would happen, and with the invasion, I felt that I was reliving um, early 2014 once again. I was in Kyiv until mid February this year on um, starting, just starting my new research project with. Um, right-wing military volunteers and military support activists trying to understand why it is that they mobilized in 2014 to uh, to support uh, formal military and, and volunteer militias and others against uh, sep Russia, Russia backed separatists. And um, I realized that over that period that I was in Kyiv that um, I had not understood uh, much about the war that was happening in Ukraine since 20, uh, 2014 because I was not there. I arrived to the UK as a researcher on, for my PhD at the University of Durham in October 2013 and as I was preparing to leave for fieldwork in Kyiv in April 2014 the war began. I was liable for conscription and I did not travel to Ukraine. Instead I studied corruption in Westminster and uh, it was only with uh, my subsequent project in 2013, uh, 2017 and now with my new research on, on war that I was able to go back and revisit uh, questions which had academic relevance but which for me um, went straight to the heart of what made me interested in the war which was how was how did I stand by and how did I watch from afar the war that was happening can you understand it without experiencing it can you understand the stories that people are telling about the war without going through the experiences of war itself. And I've personally felt that um, there was a, a, the, the invasion was a watershed moment for me for understanding the war because I, I lived in my own skin the 
the experiences that many of my interlocutors, my informants in the field, as it were, were talking about um, when, when they talked about the beginning of the war in 2014 and 2015. Um, and I felt that that per very, very deep personal disturbing experience was absolutely crucial for understanding um, in a scholarly way yeah. um, the stories that people told me um, about their mobilization in 2014 for the front. Stories which you know, often are about ardent nationalism and patriotism stories that maybe do not fit um, neat narratives about just cause in a war or about um, um, progressive politics and so on and so forth, but stories which nonetheless are, are important for, uh, for understanding the commotion that the war uh, causes in a society and for understanding how the war is changing the society because Ukraine has been absolutely transformed in eight years. And do you think, just let me pick up on that point about 2014 compared to now, because I was, I remember being in Westminster and as somebody who'd worked in the region, was interested in the region, even then having to remind people that there was still a war going on and now we still have to remind people there's a war going on. Do you think that moment in April 2014 was the fundamental changing point and what, what does it tell us about where we are just now? I think um, it was... It was a turning point for many, many reasons. Ukraine had just um, gone through a revolution which deposed a president and collapsed a very strong ruling party, as a result of which there was a void of authority across the country, within which then there emerged conditions for separatism, which Russia sponsored and, and which allowed it to turn it into a war. And um, since then, uh, the, the war, as it was developing, created conditions for nationalist movements to develop. It created, you know, it displaced um, about two and a half million people. It deprived Ukraine of four million vote, uh, four million um, people in in Crimea, which was taken over by Russia, and in the separatist republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. That's two million voters. So it completely transformed the Ukrainian Ukrainian politics and the Ukrainian political field and the structure of of the political process. And uh, this current war is uh, is going to transform it even further. Because Ukraine used to be a very diverse and often politically divided country, yeah. you know, country divided between um, people uh, of East, so-called you know, Eastern Slavic identity and people preferring um, westernizing nationalism. And right now, um, there seems to be no choice between two options anymore because because Russia has attacked and and it's taken away the legitimacy of that Eastern Slavic identity for many many Ukrainians, and so Ukraine is turning. Um, quite rapidly um, away from what had been a powerful pole in Ukrainian politics. Yeah, that's look, there's so much that, that you've touched upon there, and I want to come back to some of these themes. But Alice, you're, you've done a lot of work on visualising war and the stories around war. We've just heard two very powerful um, introductory remarks from Ukrainians who are studying at University of St Andrews, working at the University of St Andrews, but directly affected. Can you tell us a little bit about how the stories of war have an impact and, and, and can you reflect on what's happening in Ukraine at the moment and, and what your thoughts are um, about what you've heard but also about what you've seen over the past two months but also several years as well? Yeah, so uh, the way in which we are
so the, so the stories that are um, that have um, that we're finding in our um, our media and our um, uh, you know social media, the stories that we're consuming are are really shaping how we, at a distance, not just on the ground, are engaging with this traumatic um, conflict um, and you know how, how we're the, the decisions that we're actually making about how we engage with it. Yeah. That's a really good point, a really interesting point. And actually, how we engage with it is through a wide variety of areas. And I want to talk to everybody a little bit about the sources, what you're looking out for, what your reflections are, and if you're speaking to people. But Phil O'Brien, Phil, a lot of people have started following. Your, your, your academic work has become, unfortunately, I'm afraid, very, very relevant. Um, and I know a lot of people are following you on social media now for a blow-by-blow -blow account of what's happening. Could you just talk to us a little bit about your work? How are you collecting information? How are you disseminating that um, information? I, I, I'd encourage anybody to follow Phil on, on, on Twitter, and you're, but you're primarily doing it at the moment on Twitter, on social media, so you've got that real time. So we're following this conflict in real time. Could you talk to us a little bit about that, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been an extraordinary experience because Thankfully, most of the time we're at peace. We have been in peace in Europe. I have to remember the world's been at war for much of the last 20 years, but we have not been at war in Europe. And war changes things. As, as I think it was, uh, was it Trotsky who said, you might not be interested in war, but war's interested in you. Um, and we're discovering that now. The, the vision I have of war that I've developed in my research, I've sort of said is in many ways profoundly boring. It's not the drama. It's not the stories. War is a relentless process, and it's a process of construction and destruction. And I think that's what we're seeing now in Ukraine. Now, going into the war, why I was puzzled was why everyone thought Russia would conquer so easily. It was just simply you know, this, this shock and awe narrative that was being put forward. And by no experience in military history would that be likely. That's just, just not the way war works. It's certainly not anything that, that Vladimir Putin's military had given any indication that it could carry off, but we had talked ourselves, or many people had talked themselves, into this narrative of Russian military efficiency and overwhelming power, which, by the way, was very dangerous. It was very dangerous because it makes war more attractive. Yeah. I mean, certainly the Russians believe their own BS, and therefore, they were, yeah, they really thought they would conquer. But it almost led to disastrous repercussions in Ukraine. The, the U.S. and U.K. governments went to President Zelensky at the start of the war and said, we'll help you leave. You, know, we'll, you want to set up a government in exile? We'll help you do that. Now, thankfully, he had a better understanding of what was happening than the U.S. and U.K. governments. And he said no to that. But imagine if there had been a, a, a less confident Ukrainian president and how that would have worked out. And that was based on a flawed analysis of what the Russians could do. So uh, what I did is I, I sort of said, OK, what do I know a little bit about war? The things I tend to know are air power and logistics. I mean, that's what I've been doing a lot of my research. So I will watch this. Now, we live in extraordinary times. You can see things. It's not a mystery. In fact, it's the most open conflict in history. You can't hide a long military column on a road. And not only that, governments can't hide that from you because corporate satellites yeah. are taking these pictures. You can't hide the fact of whether you have air power operating over an area or not because you have to be patrolling or not patrolling. And so I just gave myself early tests on the things I know on how they work in war air power and logistics, can the Russians do anything close to what many of the analysts were saying they could do? And they fell short right from the beginning. I mean, the logistics one was a catastrophe from the start. And it, it took people a while to understand what they were seeing, My my, because you had that famous 40-mile column heading towards Kiev, which is a weird way social media works, I have to say. People were talking about that as a blitzkrieg column. I mean, this was in the papers. Yeah. Russian blitzkrieg descends on Kiev. And I actually just tweeted, this is not a blitzkrieg. This is a logistic catastrophe unfolding in front of our eyes. The last thing you want is a long, strung out column not moving on a road. I mean, you couldn't write anything worse in, in, in terms of logistics. And it just showed the Russians didn't know what they were doing. They had grotesquely underestimated 
Ukrainian ability to resist and overestimated their own ability. And so it was sort of that kind of analysis. And then in air power, everyone had been writing this great, huge Russian air force would dominate the skies over Ukraine based on a really flawed understanding of how Russian air power had been used in Syria. In Syria, it had been used to commit war crimes against people who couldn't fight back. And what the Ukrainians showed is they could fight back, and in which case they severely limited Russian air power capacity. So that's, yeah, and that, and that was open. You could see that because the Russians couldn't control the air over Ukrainian positions. So by using those two tests, which is ones you can make by looking at open source material, it's not actually that complicated. It allows, I think, a different perspective to, to emerge on war, at least compared to, to what we had expected. Diana, and I'm, I'm, Taras, I want you to reflect in, in just a moment on, on, on some of the points that have been picked up, especially about the fact this eight-year-old war. But, Diana, just first of all, Phil's talked about how we're able to track this war, trace this war, step by step. It's very, you know, if, 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 if you want the information, like anything, you can avoid it if you want to, but, but, but most people are, are, are interested, especially if, if, if you come from the country. What's it been like you know, do you follow these Twitter feeds? Do you take an interest in it? And when you're speaking to friends and family back home, are they doing it? How is that impacting on their experience of this conflict? I'll be honest. Um, well, I follow every single possible source at this yeah. point. Okay. But my yeah. greatest source of information is the people in Ukraine. Okay. And why why all you? of my family yeah. is there. All of my friends are there. And even people who I've briefly known for like cer certain periods of time, we've all gathered together over every po over every kind of social media, yeah. and I've been in touch with people whom I've known for only short periods of time. Yet now they seem to be so important to me and insightful. And it's just, I think it's very different when you follow when you read a BBC article, which mm. definitely covers the main facts of what happened. But then when you read Ukrainian independent journalists who are there, who've been in bomb shelters for 10 hours a day and who struggle to get any internet connection to upload those couple paragraphs, mm. that's what matters the most. And every single time I see someone sharing a photo from somewhere, and God forbid I, I see my friend's name who has been in that city, who has been in that particular region of the city that's being, yeah. that's being shelled, or somebody who tells me the personal side to it as in they've had an encounter with the Russian military officers or they, their village has been occupied. And I think that's the stories that definitely stick with me the most. Because, as I said, my entire family is living through this, this right this moment. So are you finding that you're getting most of your information firsthand from friends and family through your own network of content? That and the Ukrainian journalists. And the Ukrainian journalists Ukrainian journalists, journalists well. yes. Okay. And uh, to be fair, some of them are being translated into English, right, the yes. second they get published. And I think that's one of the most reliable sources I find my information from, for sure. Okay. Taras, I want I want to ask you to reflect on a couple of things. I firstly, I'm interested in where you get your information from, but secondly, um, Phil talked and Alice talked. Alice talked about Syria. You know, this decade long conflict that the Russian military been heavily involved in, um, and some of the barbarity that we see um, taking place in Ukraine is taking place in Syria, um, with the loss of disastrous loss of of life. But we also had the seizure of Crimea, and Phil was talking there about. Um, the ways in which we may be overestimated Russia and that and that was dangerous. Can you reflect on uh, uh, first of all I'd be interested in knowing where where you're getting your information, but actually I'm really interested on the reflections on how the annexation of Crimea and 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 part of of of, of the Donbass as well as Syria has had an impact on how we viewed things before the 24th of, of, of February, because you've been watching this. And actually, I'm really interested in, you talked about you went off and studied corruption in Westminster, of course, and I, you know, you, you had your reports at Westminster talking about this conflict, talking about the corruption, you know, but like the Moscow's Gold Report, the Foreign Affairs Committee came out with, which were important bits, but often overlooked and weren't really 
um, we struggled a little bit to to, to have that conversation. I'd, I'd love to get your reflections on on that. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Phil mentioned one thing. He mentioned open open sources and yeah. open sources that allow us all to uh, see firsthand evidence of troops troops movement of the atrocities, um, evidence that then. Uh, journalists in Ukraine, outside of Ukraine, take and verify uh, in order to to make it admissible perhaps later in, in, yeah. in criminal courts. Um, one thing that um, I've been doing is, you know, I was there in Ukraine until mid-February and I then had to leave because of the worsening security situation. The university was very kind to pull me out and be the voice of reason in a moment when I myself did not believe an invasion would happen. And since then, um, I could continue my research by starting to track social media accounts of um, volunteer units, pro-government militias that integrated with the Ukrainian army, with different branches of the Ukrainian military, with the National Guards, but also of social media accounts on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, on the Telegram, of military support volunteers who have been supplying the Ukrainian army and uh, the um, various mil- and various pro-government militias with everything from you know, pickup trucks to install um, anti-aircraft guns on them, to flak jackets and helmets, to uh, night vision optics and, and sniper optics, and stuff that makes Ukrainian military more efficient at resisting um, the army. And this is something that is the direct consequence of um, the be- of the way in which the war began in 2014 and the way in which the government responded in 2014. Let's step back. In, Ukraine became independent from the Soviet Union and at the moment the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. At that time, Ukraine had about 40% of the combined Soviet military capabilities and 30% of um, the Soviet military industrial complex just in one republic. It was a big republic, right? And uh, it was a West, westernmost republic and it was facing the West, as it were, uh, in the Warsaw Pact. Since then, from that military might, from 700,000 soldiers that were in Ukraine, the military was left decimated by decades of corruption, yeah. of um, demilitarization, of selling off of military assets to countries like Angola, Sierra Leone, Iraq, etc., etc. In 2014, when Russia moved in into Crimea, it did it partly because it assessed correctly that Ukrainian military could not, perhaps would not, um, respond militarily. And that's when civil society organizations like these military volunteers um, and military support volunteers moved in and took over part of the role of the state. And Ukrainian military today is, and the military volunteers are more capable of resisting the Ukrainian army, partly because of that mobilization, partly because of the way in which the civil society responded, but also because of the way in which they informally coordinate among themselves. The, the, uh, the 40 mile um, column and other sort of logistical issues could be used by the Ukrainian military against Russians because the Ukrainian units could be more mobile and more dynamic and more often acting more informally than a, a, a strictly organized m- military would be um, because they integrated this, um, you know, people with experience in 2014, but also people who maybe were not part necessarily of the Ukrainian military, but were informally coordinating with the security service in the military. So that's one thing that has stayed with us um, since t- since 2014, since the seizure, seizure of Crimea and the war in Donbass. And I think it's proving, I mean, if you'll correct me, but I think it's proving quite important in, in the way in which Ukraine has responded to the war. So can I ask, Phil, can you respond to that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your take on, is that true? And, and how did things change? Because actually, that's a really good point that, Taras has made of that question of there was corruption it, 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 the, the, the army was quite inefficient as it was elsewhere in the former Soviet Union if you um, if, if, if you went and visited any military in, in installation ac- across, there, not so much in the Baltics but, but elsewhere and certainly from my own experience in the Caucasus mm. it, I mean it, 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 it's, it was the great unknown story almost outside of Ukraine Yeah, that when you would talk to this, Taras was saying, when you talk to Ukrainians uh, and I didn't talk to that many before, but they would say, you know, we're different. We're, we have, first of all, the identity question was changing, but also the military preparations were real. Yeah. It wasn't a, a corrupt sort of post-Soviet military that was just getting by and, 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 and not preparing. From 2014 to today, they did a huge amount of preparation. Um, and you would hear that from Ukrainians, but that never filtered outside of Ukraine. So that when you look at the analysis, the pre-war analysis, Ukraine's never in it. 
it's all about what the Russians can do, but there's nothing about what the Ukrainians might do to stop it, because it was almost like, oh, well, they really can't do it. Uh, and that if anything, you know, that, that uh, the Ukrainians are sort of bystanders in their own fate, but the Ukrainians didn't see that at all, and they prepared really well. And, and we can see that by, by why the West has changed and why, say, NATO has changed on what it will give to Ukraine is because of what Ukraine has done. It's not the case that that change has come about because they, oh, you know, decided oh, now we want to help Ukraine more than we do. It's because Ukraine has put up such an extraordinary fight and been so well prepared throughout its society that actually what NATO countries realize is that, that NATO, uh, Ukraine has done so well, it needs this support. So I'm going to ask you about the Battle of Kiev very quickly. And Alice, I'm going to come to you just after Phil because I, I really want you to reflect on some of the stories and how we tell that tale because that seems to be been a really important part, I think, prior to February um, of, of, of this year. But Phil, just, just to build on that point quickly, yeah. is that what happened? Is that why there was such a failure around the Battle of Kiev that 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 you had this invasion, everybody thought Kiev was going to fall, President Zelensky is given an escape option, which he does not take. Mm. Was that a case of a narrative had been built that did not reflect the reality on the ground? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the war could be summarized very early on, the early war, in what the Russians tried to do at Hostomol Airport and how the Ukrainians reacted. The Russians tried this ludicrous operation. I mean, it was really if Arnold Schwarzenegger drew up a war plan what they would do. They'd fly in their troops, take this airfield, exploit it, and sort of run into Kiev. But it was just, it wasn't thought out. They didn't have the logistical support. It was based on not having any opposition. Yeah. So the Russians, and but they did use their best troops, which is fascinating. These are a lot of their sort so of So use the best troops. So you're saying don't believe what you see in the films. Well, we can believe, we don't, yeah. don't believe the films. But what we saw is the Russians did this boy's own kind of operation on war, and the Ukrainians reacted. Yeah. It was the fact that they didn't panic. So just for our listeners, this was to airlift um, yeah. troops into an airport close to Kiev. Very close, just uh, yeah. just to the northwest of Kiev. Yeah. And the Ukrainian reaction to that, when the Russians had sort of inserted these best troops, was swift. Yeah. And it, so I, this was prepared. You don't do that by accident. And they not only reacted swiftly, they reacted incredibly effectively and drove those forces off. In many ways, they drove them into the woods. And I think that that was just one of the early tests where people had to say, this does not happen by accident. War, war doesn't happen by accident when you get to that point. It's whether you've prepared or not. Battle, uh, so I'll be very quick. Battles don't cause, they reveal. We often look at a battle as decisive, but it's not decisive as the battle. A battle matters because it shows what people have done before the battle. Okay. So, Alice, the stories on the run-up to a conflict are pretty important. And I'm wondering, that's really interesting what Phil's saying about battles don't decide, they reveal. You know, so the storytelling beforehand becomes pretty important. And what did the storytelling around Donbass, Crimea, Syria and elsewhere, what did that tell us? Well, I think it's about what it didn't tell us and what okay. it didn't base yeah. on. And I think Phil's already touched on that, you know, the, the emphasis very much.
the, the fact that there isn't sometimes a binary between war and peace. Okay, that's a really good point in how we look at it going forward. Now, I'm going to we're we're coming to the end of a discussion. This discussion could go on and on, but unfortunately, I must bring it to an end. I'm going to ask each of you the question, and I'm going to start with you, Taras. I'm going to go from left round to right and finish up with Phil. Um, I'm afraid, unfortunately, this awful war is going to continue to dominate our screens, our social media, um, for the coming at least months, unfortunately. That's, That's something I think we have to be realistic. It is something that we will continue to watch and consume um, in in the media. If people are watching this and they don't know too much about Ukraine, um, what what would you like them to look out for? What would you like them to to listen and think differently when they're when they're watching the the media? What's your message to people um, who are who are watching this? I think one thing that I'd say is that people should reflect about the ways in which this war is about much more than Ukraine, that this is a much larger war. It is a small world war. It is a war in which all of us are implicated um, because of the ways in which the military industrial complex works, the defense industry and its military supplies, because of the way in which British politics has been implicated with the war, with the visit of our prime minister to Ukraine, a kind of a um, John to save his own prime ministership, you know, and um, also with the way in which the disruption of agricultural supplies from Ukraine is going to, is going to affect, um, it's going to cause famine potentially, and it's going to affect um, the Middle East and North Africa, and is going to create a new wave of migration. So we need to think about the connections in the world that a made the war po- the war possible and make the continuation of it possible on both the Ukrainian side and on the Russian side, for example, with oil and supplies and money and that sort of stuff. But um, also the the connections that put us in the systems that where Ukraine is at the center, uh, with uh, with the conflict and the war of it, it, it being at the center of these systems.
Okay. I'm talking about younger voices. Diana, I'm wondering if you can reflect on 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 the question I posed about looking forward and and um what we should be looking out for, what you'll be looking out for and, and as, as as things go forward. I think one of the biggest dreams of mine would be that um, I know that eventually this war will end and yep. there will be there will be a new Ukraine and that will be the country that I myself as every single Ukrainian I know will be will be helping to build will be making it stronger we will be making it greater and I hope that everyone who is experiencing right now will be welcoming will be helping and will be helping to build the reality well the new reality that would allow the voices to be heard allow the voices of everybody as you said the civilians first of all because that's what the country is fighting for for every single voice to be heard for the freedom to exist because for such a long period of time russian imperialism has been overlooked and that's one of the reasons that caused this because We've only been focusing on one side without truly seeing the entire truth. And I do hope that as as the things, I guess, happen and as more and more people unfortunately get involved, some of those people will be the ones who will, who will help solve it in the best way for all of us, especially for the growing children, for the younger generations in Ukraine who right now, as you said, you looked at the art and... Um, how many people around the world submitted it and how compassionate everybody is and it made me think about the um the drawings of children that i saw on social media of the children who have been hiding in mariupol for over mm -hmm. 50 days in bomb shelters and their drawings are very different they haven't seen the sunlight they no longer paint the little circle of sun their reality has been so damaged with the ruins and with death and I think that's one thing that I look forward to is that their reality changes first of all and they they can believe in ha in happy world and that they can believe in fairy tales and miracles once again and that they will be able to grow up in a happy country in a happy place just like I once did two things building on what diana just said the war will end um and it will be a mess that it really there will have to be a peace treaty because ukraine is not going to conquer russia and wrong russia is not going to conquer ukraine so we do have to start well the ukrainians and and maybe some people in russia need to start imagining what the end of the war will be so you know the, the, it will it will please no one fully it will have to be a compromise uh, and there will have to be some bitter choices made on on some sides but it will end uh, the best way to end it now this is a bit I don't know if this sounds hard it's best to end it quickly and that will be from maybe an escal a short-term escalation of the war what we're going to see in the Donbass might be horrible but actually the best way to end the war is to end it quickly the longer a war goes on, the worse it is. It really—I mean, you can do it. A, a, you know, a scientific study length of war almost always leads to you know, the growth in casualties, the growth in horror, and it might be—it might fit uneasily on the IR community now, and it certainly does to me. That the best thing to do is to give Ukraine what it needs. Yeah. Um, if you want to end the war on the best possible terms for Ukraine, it's going to be by giving them the most military aid now that they can use. And it might, again, be uncomfortable, but it's the best way to end the war quickly and not have it drawn out. Well, look, there's going to be some really hard conversations um, to come. There's so much that we, 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 we could cover, and even in this longer episode, we've, we've, we've barely scratched the surface of so many really important issues. Alice and Phil, I want to thank you for, for, for your expertise and, 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 and your insights that have been really valuable. But Taras and Diana, I want to thank you in particular for coming along today and giving such powerful testimony that I think is, is, is worth listening to. And thanks to everybody out there for listening to us um, today. And please um, 
keep paying attention to what's what's going on. Please keep discussing it, debating it in a constructive and productive way. Thank you.